Hi again, this is Pastor Jeff from Community Covenant Church with the Sunday morning worship message here on September 13th. Just as a point of um, information, next Sunday, the 20th, will be our final Sunday outside under the tents. On the last Sunday of September, the 27th, we will move in for the first time back into our sanctuary to hold our worship inside the building. And so right now we are in the process of figuring out all the details of what that looks like to uh, arrange seating so there's still spacing between people so there's a sense of uh, uh, distance and and security to make sure we're not uh, accidentally uh, passing around anything. And uh, so we're in in the process, but uh, we've got uh, one more week. And let me also just assure you that I will continue to provide the uh, Sunday message and my daily devotionals um, in this format. So for those of you who are not physically able to get to us because of distance or because of uh, your own health concerns, we will still provide these kind of things. So hopefully that'll help to make up somewhat. Uh, for not being able to be present with us. But, of course, we look forward to the time when we can all be physically together uh, to uh, share a fellowship and to worship our Lord in His presence together. Well, in 1944, um, the U.S. was still in the midst of World War II, and that included um, a battle against Japan. And this officer... Hiru Onada was an intelligence officer in the Japanese Army. And in 1944, he, along with some other soldiers, went to an island in the Philippines. August of 1945 ended the World War II with the Japanese surrender, but that did not include Officer Lieutenant Onada. He and uh, three other soldiers fled into the jungles of this Philippine island and did not know that the war was officially over. And so he kept fighting for the next 30 years. He ended up being the last one there. Um, The other officers died or disappeared, um, but he continued to fight for 30 years. It was only after a former, his former commanding officer traveled to the island and ordered him to stop fighting in 1974 that he finally ended his personal war. And that's this picture on the right um, when he came out and ended the fight. Now, you know, there are some people who kind of admire this idea of never say die attitude of those who will continue to stand firm and they'll face adversity and they won't give up. But when it comes to our growth as a follower of Jesus to maturity in our relationship to God, requires us to surrender. That's the only way that we can experience the fullness that God promises us, that Jesus said the abundant life that is there available for each of us. When we receive the gift of salvation by admitting our sin and our need for forgiveness and by believing that Jesus' death and resurrection makes forgiveness and a new life possible, and then choosing to follow Jesus as our Lord, That's the beginning of a new life. But as we talked about last week, just being a Christian and a Christian over years does not automatically mean that we are also maturing in our faith over time. So the series that we've started is about being really mature. So about real maturity. And that is about growing stronger in our faith and maturing so that we become more and more like Jesus. That's what maturity as a Christian looks like. So today, um, it, we need to remember that it's not simply about trying harder, like Lieutenant Onada fighting on your own in the jungle and that if I really try, I will carry on the whole war by myself. No, maturity happens through a partnership between you and God. Prior to Jesus going to the cross, he told his disciples in John 14, verses 15 to 17, If you love me, obey my commandments. 
and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. When Jesus says another advocate, he's not talking like um, of a different kind than he, but instead he's talking about of the same kind as Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of Jesus, as it says in Acts. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three specific unique persons, but all one God. That's the concept of the Trinity, and it's boggled the complete understanding of humans for the last 2,000 years, but it is the foundation of our faith, is that God is present, personal, powerful presence in the form of the Holy Spirit. Now, depending on your own um, faith background, you may either have confusion about the idea of the Holy Spirit or maybe even concern when the topic of the Holy Spirit is brought up. But Oswald Chambers, who um, most of you are familiar with through his devotional, My Utmost for His Highest, um, wrote, The Spirit is the first power we come to know, but the last power we come to understand. Just think of this. When you gave your life to Christ, it was the Holy Spirit who you experienced. If you experienced an emotion, if you experienced a sense of God's presence in a powerful way, or just sensing that God was changing you, you were a different person than you were before you did this. That is the evidence in the experience of the Holy Spirit in your life. And frankly, your capability... To know, love, and follow God only becomes a reality through the powerful working of the Holy Spirit in you. So we are completely dependent on the Holy Spirit. So today we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit a little bit and how the Holy Spirit plays a role in our maturing and our maturing in being able to follow Jesus more closely, or as we kind of used the phrase last week, our followership which is like discipleship. It's a following Jesus more closely. So first of all, let's just talk about the Holy Spirit. Um, what's the Holy Spirit doing for us? Why is the Holy Spirit sent by Jesus for us? Well, first of all, the Holy Spirit is here to aid you, to assist you. Most people like this idea of getting help from God, but we tend to approach that selfishly. I want God to help me, but I want God to help me to do what I want, my purposes, my intentions. So it's like, God, I've got this big test. God, I want you to help me so that I get a good grade, so that I remember the things that I studied or, or maybe the things I didn't study. You intervene on my behalf for what I want. Or God, I want you to help me so that I have a successful business um, or whatever I'm doing. It's all about me and my agenda. It's not uncommon. Um, Studies over these last 10 years or so have um, mostly focusing on young adults um, looking at their idea of how they see God and what they view and their view of faith. And the term that they came up for the overwhelming view of God is this idea that they've labeled moralistic therapeutic deism. Now that sounds kind of, you know, highfalutin, but let me just break it down. Moralistic. Morals. Do the right thing. Their idea is that God wants me to do good things. God wants me to act kind to other people. God wants me to do, uh, follow the rules and, and do all this. Therapeutic is about therapy. It's like feeling um, how I'm feeling. And so they want God to make them feel good. I want God to just give me warm fuzzies and uh, to uh, feel good about life and to not be afraid or, or whatever negative emotions I may otherwise have. And the idea of deism is that there is a God, but it's not a personal God. It's just a God out there who created everything. But now his job here is to make sure I do good and that I feel good. So this idea is is more of like a concept of God. And and by the way, it goes beyond Christianity. This is people who would just kind of have a 
a, a view of God as sort of a new age philosophy or a whatever. Um, God is this combo of a divine butler and a cosmic therapist. It's God wants me to be good and to feel good. And that's what I benefit from God. So when it comes to God helping me, I want God to help me to accomplish what I want and my agenda. But unfortunately, that's what that's not what the Holy Spirit's role is. It's not to do what you want or to make you feel good and to, um, to do good, but otherwise it's just kind of on your own. It's not about your agenda. It's about God's agenda. Because the Holy Spirit's aiding us to become who he wants me to become. And he does this by these kind of things. First of all, helping you by teaching you. It's the Holy Spirit who helps you to understand God's word and apply it to your life. The Holy Spirit is an encourager, encouraging you in your faith and your confidence in God. Um, The Holy Spirit is there also to convict you. It's not just to pat you on the back and make you feel good, but sometimes it's to make you feel guilty or make you feel like, oh, I'm, I need to change my attitude or I need to change my behavior. Get back on the right path and do what God wants. But at the same time, it's also there to empower you. The Holy Spirit is there because he wants to direct you where you should go, but it's not on your own. You're not like Lieutenant Onada out there in the jungle trying to do it by yourself. It's with the Holy Spirit's direction, but then the power to follow those directions. And the Holy Spirit is there to lead us, to give us that right direction and path to say, you should do this. Oh, I'm sensing the Spirit wants me to say this or to behave this certain way, to take certain actions. And then ultimately transformation. That's the whole goal of what God wants in us so that we can become more and more like Jesus. It's not my agenda, it's his agenda. And that is to become more and more like Jesus. So the Holy Spirit is there to aid us, but also, like we talked about last time, to abide with you. Um, Our main role and job in this relationship is to stay connected, to abide uh, with Jesus, to remain united with him. Again, the verse we looked at last week, John 15, 5. Jesus says, yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Think about the time that Jesus was with his disciples. I've often thought how cool it would have been to be physically with Jesus in his presence. Those disciples got to hang out with him for three years, 24-7. They saw him, they listened to him, they heard him, they watched him his behavior and his teaching. They, they interacted with him in personal ways. You know, they went fishing together. They probably were roughhoused together. I don't know, but they were with him all the time. And I think that would be really cool. But you know what? It was an external presence of God. Jesus had something better in mind. In John 16, he shared with his disciples in verses five through seven. He said, but now I am going away to the one who sent me and not one of you is asking where I'm going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away. Because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. Jesus' return to heaven made it possible for the Holy Spirit to be with us internally. Not just Jesus externally with his followers, but now God's presence internally even closer, stronger, more complete presence, truly abiding in us. The Apostle Paul wrote um, to to Jesus' followers in the city of Corinth, and he talked about this idea of having the presence of God with us. And he referred back to Moses. When Moses was there on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments, God's presence made a difference, and it impacted him. And and so he put on a a veil over his face so that the the glowing presence of God, as it disappeared, it wouldn't be obvious to the people so much. So he talked about having this veil that kind of was 
not fully experiencing God's presence. It was an external, but still it was not quite there. So in 2 Corinthians 3, 16 to 18, Paul is saying, but whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit. And wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. How awesome is that? Our maturing followership is a lifelong process of experiencing His presence internally, fully there abiding with us. And as a result, we become changed more and more into his glorious image. That's cool. So practically, if the Holy Spirit is there to aid us and to abide with us, how do I fully experience God's help? To live intently and intentionally in his presence and to experience what he wants to do in maturing me more and more. Well, Paul in Ephesians 5.18 said this, Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, that may sound like a weird comparison about getting drunk versus being filled with the Holy Spirit. But think about this. I'm sure most all of you, if not everyone, has witnessed someone who's drunk. What do you see? What's what's the experience of what that person's like because they've been inebriated? Well, their speech is slurred. Um, Their thoughts are not clear. They're kind of dulled. Um, And their movements are impaired. They can't walk straight, all those kind of things. So you've got their, their way they talk and the way they think and the way they move is all been lessened because of the influence of the alcohol. They have surrendered control to this substance. Now let's think about the contrast. Instead of that, be filled with the Holy Spirit. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, when you are fully surrendered to His control, unlike the alcohol, then your words are going to be influenced in a positive way by the Holy Spirit's presence, right? The things you say and the way you say it are going to be influenced positively. The thoughts that you have, the way you're thinking about yourself, about other people, about circumstances, are going to be enhanced by the Holy Spirit guiding them. And certainly your actions, the way you treat each other, the way you act in different ways is going to also be controlled by the Spirit and it's going to be positive. All of these things, your words, your thoughts, your deeds, are all going to be more and more reflective of Jesus. Because you're allowing Jesus' Spirit, the Holy Spirit in you, to control you. What an awesome, positive contrast to the negative influence of alcohol on somebody. We want to be filled. In the same way that alcohol controls somebody negatively, we want to be filled with the Spirit so that we are controlled positively in our words, our thoughts, our deeds. It's about active surrender. It's the choice of surrendering to the Holy Spirit to control us and to do what the Spirit wants to do in us. I've shared this with some of you before, but in 19, or excuse me, in 2011, I needed strabismus eye surgery because I had this thyroid disease called Graves' disease. It was hyperthyroid. And it oftentimes, in my case, it led to, like it does for many people, um, what they call thyroid eye disease or Graves' disease. And what it meant was that the muscles, in my case, it was just in my right eye, contracted, the interior lower muscles contracted so they didn't stretch. It was like pulled down. And so, you know, like this goofy picture there on the left, um, when I tried to look up to the left or up up to the right my right eye wouldn't be able to go up there so when before i had the surgery that's as far um my right eye look at my right eye there that is the farthest that my right eye could look up to the right was just straight ahead 
And so it looked kind of goofy when I wanted to look goofy in a photo. Um, so I had to go to Overlake Hospital and I put myself completely in the hands of Dr. Leonard. And it was a little scary. The idea of having your eye worked on. Now, I don't know. I never looked at a video or anything of what this looks like, but... I do know that as he described it to me, they detached this muscle from my eyeball and then reattached it elsewhere so that my eye could have more movement. That's kind of creepy to think about your eyeball because I don't know, did they take it out of the socket somehow? They must have, I don't know. But uh, this is what, you know, after the case, I, you know, had a lot of swelling and stuff like that. And, but then my eye, I noticed because I was, before I had the surgery, I was experiencing double vision, meaning my eyes weren't pointing the same direction all the time. And it was really discouraging and difficult. You know, the truth is that sometimes it's easier to surrender to a surgeon than to surrender to the Holy Spirit. Now, I know many of you have had to go under the knife for surgeries for different ailments. And maybe it was a little scary, but ultimately you're trusting the surgeon. You go, I'm going to surrender to the surgeon to do what's going on here. But do I surrender to the Holy Spirit to have complete control of my life? If we fail to surrender to the surgeon, or if I had failed to surrender to Dr. Leonard, or if I fail to surrender to the Holy Spirit, the result is the same. I am stuck with double vision, or as scripture talks about, double-mindedness. In James 4, um, verses 4 and 8, it says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend with the world becomes an enemy of God. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. What does that mean? Double-minded. It means that you are trying to serve two masters at the same time. You're trying to do your own thing and follow God at the same time. And oftentimes those are diametrically opposed. We have to choose to submit ourselves completely to the Holy Spirit's control if we want to experience the fullness of what God wants. Otherwise, we are just at a tug of war and we're not going to be able to function. We're not to be able to experience what God likes. And we certainly are not going to grow in maturity in our following Jesus. We need to surrender. It's our only hope for full health and life as God intended us to experience and to become more and more like Jesus. So when we surrender, the first thing we need to do is we need to get real. Be honest about yourself. What is it that you are holding back that you have not surrendered to the Holy Spirit's control? Again, like we said last week, it's, this is not about looking out the window at other people. This is about looking into a mirror at yourself evaluate yourself, maybe even invite the Holy Spirit to point out to you what you need and what it is. It's getting real and honest and saying, I am trying to do this on my own. I have not surrendered. But then you need to get specific. You know, the, the whole, you know, I surrender all, you know, that, that uh, song is a great sentiment, but it usually doesn't lead to any change when it's just like, yeah, I surrender all but then we don't get into the nitty gritty and actually deal with what we need to really surrender. That's where inviting the Holy Spirit to point out an area of your life that you need to submit specifically. Maybe it's an area of your tongue, the language you use, the way that you speak to other people. Maybe it's an area of your um, some stronghold in your life of, of an area of lust or an area of anger or an area of um, lying to people. I don't know what it is, but you do. And as you are opening up and specifically submitting to the control of the Holy Spirit, that's where the Spirit can start working. It's giving that up. It's saying, I can't do that, but I've tried before. It's not about you trying on your own, remember. It's about you submitting it and allowing the Holy Spirit to start doing the work and giving you the power to deal with it. And then you want to get some evidence of what's going on. 
look for evidence of what is happening. How is the Holy Spirit helping this to change into more Christ-like way? Look for evidence of your old nature fading away, that you're not like you were. Look for evidence of the fruit of the Spirit showing up in your life in these areas. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the natural things that grow in our life when the Holy Spirit is allowed to be in control of our life. And also look for evidence of your confidence in Christ growing too. The sense of Jesus truly guiding you and leading you and that you are abiding with him. Those are all things that you can look for and they are all things that will encourage you to let you know that you have truly surrendered. When we submit to the control of the Holy Spirit and are filled by him, it's all for our own good, but it's also all for God's glory. Because then we'll be living more and more like Jesus. And then Jesus can use that in other people's lives. Theologian Wayne Grudem wrote this. He said, To be filled with the Holy Spirit means to be filled with the immediate presence of God to the extent that you are feeling what God himself feels, desiring what God desires, doing what God wants, speaking by God's power, praying and ministering in God's strength, and knowing with the knowledge that God himself gives. Boy, wouldn't that be awesome if that was true about us? All of these things being controlled by the Holy Spirit's presence abiding in us because we've allowed him full access and we've submitted completely to what he wants to do to change us. In the same contrast, again, alcohol totally controls these things in our lives, but the Holy Spirit can control them in a positive way, in all these kind of things. When our lives reflect God's presence, other people are going to notice too. And then that much more can we see the joy of our life being able to be used by God to draw other people to him as well. So remember, your capability to know love and follow God only becomes a reality through the powerful working of the Holy Spirit in you. Choose to submit, surrender, surrender a new part, one part at a time. You don't have to be overwhelmed by all of it, but say, Holy Spirit, what is it the first thing you want me to surrender that I've been holding back? And then when you do that, you are opening yourself up to his presence and power to become a new person and to become more and more like Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this good news of your gift of the Holy Spirit, your personal and powerful presence in our lives. And the difference that makes when we surrender completely to your control, we become the person that we long to be. And that is more and more like you and your person. And the way that you think and speak and act becomes who we are as well. Lord, forgive us for the times when we have been holding back in those areas of our life where we've kept for ourselves. Help us to take that step of saying, boy, life in this area is nothing good, nothing I'm proud of. I want to experience what God has for me. God, thank you that you answer that prayer and that it is your power within us helps us to become who you want us to be, a better reflection of Jesus' presence in us. And so we thank you for what you have accomplished and what you are still going to accomplish as we surrender to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you go through this tough process. As I'm doing the same thing. Each day we need to say, am I fully surrendered? And how can I experience more of God's presence through the Holy Spirit in me? So God bless you, and uh, let me know if I can be any encouragement or help um, in er any area of your life and what you're going through. God bless, and I look forward to the time when we can be together. Bye-bye.